think I rise to move the following resolution. Whereas pursuant to Article 29 one of the Constitution, the Governor General may make a proclamation of emergency declaring that a state of public emergency for the purposes of this article exists in the Bahamas. Now therefore be it resolved that this House affirms the continuance in effect of the emergency powers COVID-19 pandemic, extension of section 171 of the Local Government Act, Chapter 37, Order 2020, <coughs> made on the 21st day of August 2020 until the 31st day of October 2020. Mr. Speaker, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, this deadly and very contagious virus was designated as a novel coronavirus. This means it was a new virus, a virus that the world had not seen before. And such a novel or new virus <coughs> meant that the peoples of the world, medical professionals, scientists, governments, and countries had to learn as quickly as possible, as much as possible, about this very, very dangerous virus. We had to learn about how it is transmitted. We had to learn, Mr. Speaker, about how deadly and contagious it is and who are the most vulnerable. We had to learn how to diagnose and to treat those individuals infected by this virus and the world began a massive and unprecedented global effort to create an effective vaccine, an effort that is still ongoing. We have to look back in history at past pandemics to see how to respond to COVID-19. We also had to look to new technologies and ideas, such as advanced contact tracing and modern diagnostics to respond to a virus that spread around the world in approximately 100 days because of modern aviation and other modes of travel and transportation. Though it has seemed like an, an eternity, the world has been in this pandemic for slightly less than a year. We are still learning about this virus and its long-term health effect. And at the beginning of the pandemic, most governments imposed similar measures such as mask wearing, curfews, lockdowns, contact tracing, and physical distancing measures to limit the spread of this deadly virus. Our first priority, Mr. Speaker, my first priority and obligation was to save lives and to protect our people. And that has not changed. And this is why we acted quickly and aggressively at the very beginning, even though we were very heavily criticized by some in this chamber for our initial emergency orders and actions. Some of these critics, Mr. Speaker, said that the orders were unnecessary and too strong. Some in this chamber were slow to appreciate the dangers posed 
by this deadly virus and the emergency measures that were needed. Though they have been proven wrong over and over again, they have yet to acknowledge that we did what was right and timely in order to save lives. I once again offer condolences to the families of those who have lost loved ones. And let us continue to pray for the recovery of those in hospital or at home who are still struggling with COVID-19, including those with long-term health effects. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that the Bahamas was among the first countries in the world to require the wearing of masks, though even then there were those who said we were unnecessarily restricting certain freedoms and who appeared to play down the severity of the looming pandemic. However, thankfully, the vast majority of Bahamians understood the need to care for themselves and for one another by adopting various life-saving measures. Most Bahamians, Mr. Speaker, understood the need to be their brothers and sisters keepers. They knew the diseases and its deadly effects were not partisan and did not their political colors. I again offer full some praise for all of those in our country who responded quickly and with a spirit of national unity, including those who put aside partisanship and reached for a higher national goal, national good, and shared purpose. Mr. Speaker, I am truly grateful that my training and years of experience as a medical doctor helped me to appreciate the danger of this virus at the very beginning of this pandemic. I also realized as Prime Minister that the country needed to continue to find a balance between the health, economic, and social needs of our people. We knew it would not be easy finding such a balance, but that with the cooperation of as many Bahamians and residents as possible, we could confront this virus better together. This is the same search for balance that countries around the world continue to struggle with and will continue to struggle with for some time to come. It is a constant and ongoing balancing act. Mr. Speaker, over the past seven months, we boosted our healthcare infrastructure to better respond to this virus. We improved national testing. We improved contact tracing. We revised emergency orders as necessary. We communicated constantly and regularly with the Bahamian people. We provided unprecedented financial, economic, and social assistance, especially to the most vulnerable. We are feeding, Mr. Speaker, tens of thousands of Bahamians who hit hard times due to the economic effects of the pandemic, with the government now spending approximately $1.3 million every week. 
We consulted widely with many share stakeholders and the broader public, and we provided specific plans in a number of areas related to the virus, including phased plans for the reopening of the economy and the upcoming plans from the Economic Recovery Committee. When we erred and made mistakes, we acknowledged them, we listened, we did better, and we pledged to continue to do better. We are, Mr. Speaker, in this fight together. Today, in our Caribbean and North American neighbors, throughout the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and even in countries that have been acknowledged to have generally the best responses to the pandemic, the pandemic still requires various emergency orders. Indeed, many are currently battling new waves with some returning to national lockdowns. I only ask individuals to look at the European nations. Nearly one million people have died and no one knows when this pandemic will end. Few countries in the world no longer require some type of emergency orders and restrictions. I rise today, Mr. Speaker, in support of today's resolution, extending various emergency orders until the 31st day of October 2020. The measures in the order in the emergency power orders are not ends in themselves. They are tools or measures used to protect and to save lives and are available in case of an emergency as a number of health professionals have noted publicly over the past few days. Today, Mr. Speaker, I also wish to note a number of changes to various emergency orders. Mr. Speaker, because our nation is an archipelago with varying circumstances, we sought to modulate the various measures depending on the specific circumstances in each of our given family islands. This is why we created various schedules of islands. And I am pleased to announce today that commercial and additional social activities may resume as normal on the following islands. Andres, <laughs> Acklands, Crooked Island, Long Key, <coughs> Berry Islands, Bimini, Cat Island, Elutra, Grand Bahama, Inagua and Meguana, <laughs> with physical distancing and mask wearing protocols in place. Mr. Speaker, this simple mask saved lives. I'd asked the Bahamian populace three weeks ago, or two weeks ago, to just adhere and wear this simple mask and adhere to the protocol for three weeks. Given that time, 
would be in a better position to save our economy, save more lives, save your brothers and sisters, mothers, aunts, uncles, and cousins. I ask for a distinct cooperation. It was this simple mask, Mr. Speaker, would assist us in adequately opening up our borders safely. And I ask all Bahamians, this simple mask would save our tourist industry. Mr. Speaker, I remembered the former president of the United States, great president, asked the question, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Now, Mr. Speaker, I say to you, this is what you can do. By wearing this simple mask, it is a shield against viral infection. It is an anti-viral Scud missile. And in fact, some of the most professionals today are saying that the virus is just as effective or more effective than the vaccine. The mask, the mask. Some of the most prominent professionals today are saying that this mask is just as effective and in some cases more effective than the vaccine. And they recommend that we utilize the antiviral scud missile that I hold in my hand. That is very effective. <laughs> Mr. Be Mr. Speaker, the Hamans are very, very intelligent and creative. The other day, I heard a particular jingle talking about wearing of mask to save ourselves and do this for your country. A simple, simple mask. A simple mask, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we had, we had spoken just recently about an incident of a member of staff House of Parliament who was infected with the COVID virus. But I watch you, Mr. Speaker. You wear your mask continuously and you were protected in spite of being some degree of proximity. I watched the other clerks and they too wore their mask and they too were protected, negative. And I watched this parliament today and every member is armed with their antiviral scud missile. Mr. Speaker, you were protected. And therefore, it is time that the behemoths, each and every behemoth, do their part. And as we open and extend the opening of our borders. Many countries are undergoing second and in some instances third surges or third waves. We can mitigate and prevent or minimize ourselves experiencing a third wave simple device can protect us until the missile, the vaccine arrives. Simple ammunition, Mr. Speaker. And therefore, I ask the Bahamians, 
as Kennedy asked, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And this is your opportunity to have our borders opened and our people and our guests are safe. This is our opportunity to be recognized throughout the world as a COVID free and a very disciplined and compliant nation. So as the rest of the world experience third wave, we can reduce that possibility by just simple discipline. Mr. Speaker, the islands that I mentioned join islands like Chub Key, Harbor Island, Long Key, Long Island, Ragged Island, Rum Key, San Salvador, and Spanish Wells. Yes. Yes. While a curfew will no longer be in effect for these islands, health officials recommend that a 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew remain in effect for Grand Bahama. Health officials also recommend that beaches remain open daily on the Grand Bahama from 5 a.m. to 12 noon for the time being. And because of the number of cases on New Providence, Mr. Speaker, the provisions under the current emergency powers orders will remain in place. And further, because of the performance of indicators being tracked by health officials, the provisions under the current emergency power powers order will also remain in place for Abaco at this particular time. However, on Abaco, beaches may now open daily between 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. And if you want to go to 12 midnight, nobody cares. Enjoy yourself. Mr. Speaker, I have I have been longing I have been longing to go to the beach. But the beaches here in Nassau, because they close at twelve and I'm normally at work. 7.30. It don't give me much opportunity. But um, Andres is open. And um, I'm going, I'm traveling to Andres with the member of parliament either Saturday or Sunday. We have not decided the time. And which beach you going on? Which beach you going on? I just bought the bathing suit. <laughs> I didn't have a bathing suit. I just bought one this week. <laughs> Let him so, take you to Stanley Creek now. Now, I don't yet have the six pack. What is it? The six pack? I, the six pack to wear a bathing suit. So I will still have my T-shirt on. Is that okay? <laughs> the speaker. Weddings on all islands in the country may be held in a religious facility following protocols following protocols and the Ministry of Health approved guidelines currently in place for church services. Church services, Mr. Speaker, are now held in the church using protocols. Weddings must follow the same protocols. And they must all, at the wedding, except the bride and the groom, be armed with their antiviral scud missile. <laughs> For Abaco and New Providence, Mr. Speaker, 
wedding receptions may be held outdoors only with physical distancing and mask wearing protocols. On all other islands, wedding receptions may be held indoors and outdoors with physical distancing and mask wearing protocols. Exuma, you happy? And say you happy. You don't you don't you don't you don't forget upon bow, you can sit. Yes, I just wanted the the chair recognizes the honorable member. I wondered if the Prime Minister would confirm on the record that Exuma is in fact included in the list of islands he mentioned because he he did he did say it uh off the record i believe i didn't have a chance to get it on the record and and my people didn't didn't hear it as well so and i, I just wondered if he would in case in case your people didn't hear it in case your people didn't hear it and they're only your, they're only your people temporarily until election is called so so that my people in exuma can hear Yes, <laughs> yes, Exuma is included. Yes, you know you don't like the No, 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 no. Mr. Speaker, on all islands, that's Exuma too, all islands, including Abaco and New Providence, funerals may be held in a religious facility following protocols and Ministry of Health approved guidelines currently in place for church services. For Abaco and New Providence, graveside services and or internment will be held with 10 people in attendance, not including officiant and mortuary workers. We pass are not permitted for Abaco and New Providence. On all other islands, graves are. <laughs> <laughs> Abaco start in the turn. Abaco start in the turn. On all other islands, graveside services and or internment may be held with 30 people in attendance. Repass may be held with no more than 20 in attendance. Mr. Speaker, I just visited Abaco. I mean, they lie on me all over social media. But um, I just came back. <laughs> I, I just came back from Abaco, and I was shocked that a very active social gathering was occurring. Nobody wearing masks, and there was at least 150 individuals participating. And it's events like those that would cause one infected individual to just ricochet throughout the community. And therefore, I ask those individuals in Abaco, their, your economy is doing well. I spoke to young people over there and they told me that they have two jobs and can obtain a third one if necessary. The jobs are there. The only stranglehold in Abaco are the accommodations. But I've been reassured by the DRA They've gotten the properties already. The plots of land crown has already been granted to the DRA. They've, been, they've assured me that they've completed the RFP. The government will provide to its citizens the land free of charge. The government will only charge for the infrastructure and depending on the number of lots, Mr. Speaker, the number of lots or plots will be divided into the cost of infrastructure. So it will not surprise me that the government had made a commitment, sorry, Mr. Speaker, the government had made a commitment to also pay for the infrastructure. My apology. The government had made a commitment to provide the Bahamian populace with the free land and to place in the, the, in, the um, in, 
place the infrastructure in situ. Therefore, they are inviting DRA, are inviting contractors to build particular homes where individuals can now buy these homes, excluding the cost for the land, excluding the cost for the infrastructure, and all homes will be built duty free. Oh. Now, Mr. Speaker, what is so unique about this? There are some contractors, Andres Dexter, and that's my home, it's coming, it's coming. Annie Lutra, Annie Lutra. We know the property. You know we have Dorian Mount, um, <laughs> What is so unique about this, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> the government does not have the funds now to put in the infrastructure, but the contractors would put in the infrastructure and build the homes. <gasps> and therefore, if the home cost $80,000, $90,000, because the government made a commitment to put in the infrastructure and the contractor would have done that for government, the government will advance for those individual if the infrastructure per lot is five or $10,000. If it's $10,000, then the government will advance $10,000 towards that individual's home, which meant that their down payment is already done. The Speaker, the DRA should be commencing that very soon, and they should be having groundbreaking sometime next month in October for the community center in Central Pine being sponsored and paid for by the international community and private sectors here in the Bahamas. Bahamas. But we have an aggressive plan. Andres is not excluded. Zuma, I mean, um, Ilutra is not excluded. And we have Grand Bahama is not excluded. And um, Exuma. I won't say yet what we have planned there, but I can say it's not your plan, it's our plan. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, on all, on all islands, all islands, gyms are permitted to open, subject to protocols and guidelines approved by the Ministry of Health. Facilities, facilities will be inspected periodically by health officials. Who gonna be mad with me? Uh, no, 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 that's right, that's exercise on the street. That's free, that's free. You know, I have to take advantage of the freeness. Mr. Speaker. We remain committed to the reopening of the economy in the area of tourism by mid-October with the necessary protocols that must be put in place. And tourism will provide another update soon. But Mr. Speaker, I again urge the Bahamian people that this can be successful the Bahamas can be the envy of the world. Our tourism product can bounce back. Our borders can be open safely. But we must travel with our Scud missile. Mr. Speaker, we will prevent, we will present a plan very soon a plan to show a plan to remove so we'll present very soon Mr. Speaker a plan to remove both domestic and international quarantine related to travel. Yes, sir. 
And the Minister of Tourism will give an update on such plan very soon. Tourism officials, Mr. Speaker, in the public and private sectors have been work working very hard over many months to devise plans for a phased reopening. It is unfortunate, unduly harsh and unfair to criticize the staff of the Ministry of Tourism for having no plans. This, Mr. Speaker, is disingenuous, untrue, unhelpful, and unfortunate. If one has any advice or constructive criticism for the hard-working staff of the Ministry of Tourism and Aviation and other stakeholders involved in creating plans for reopening, such help would be welcomed. But it is deeply disappointing when some people launch unfounded and unfair criticism on those trying hard to launch the reopening of tourism. And I salute those tourist ambassadors, those who work with tourism for their efforts. Mr. Speaker, let us give them our help and encouragement, not broad condemnation. I will have more to say about tourism in an upcoming national address on the economy. No one should be under any illusion as to how long and how difficult it will be to restore our economy generally and tourism specifically. Recovery, stronger, together is going to take a long time. But I assure the Bahamian people that we are preparing the groundwork for recovery. This week, I will receive an initial report from the Economic Recovery Committee, which I will also report on in the weeks ahead. I also assure the Bahamian people that we will act boldly and will offer plans for structural reform that will transform, diversify, and modernize our Bahamas into a 21st century economy that will seize the future and will be a model for our region. Mr. Speaker, 2020 has not been the year any of us imagined. The COVID-19 pandemic put on hold so many of the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of our people, including our young Bahamians. Children's education has been disrupted. Many businesses, including small businesses, are still struggling. We have spent months barely seeing our friends and relatives out of fear of catching or spreading the virus. Vaccines are in development, but when they will be ready and when they will be deployed comprehensively around the world is unknown. This pandemic is the most significant national emergency in our modern history. Bahamians have died, Mr. Speaker. Bahamians are sick. There are also those who have long-term health effects, some of which may last for many years or a lifetime. There are people who had the virus some time ago and supposedly recovered, yet they still suffer debilitating and lingering effects. No one knows how long these effects will last. Many are suffering, our forefathers wisely saw there would be times like these when our nation would be put to the test. They entrusted in the Governor General the lawful power to declare proclamation of emergency. They knew that in an all-out crisis, swift 
and decisive action would be needed to save Bahamian lives. We are here to extend those lawful emergency powers because we are still in an emergency. We live in an emergency due to the pandemic. This is the first time in our modern history that our government has had to fully mobilize to face a crisis of this nature affecting the entire Bahamas simultaneously. All resources are being brought to bear in our hospitals to treat the sick. We are providing historic and unprecedented amounts of unemployment benefits and assistance to individuals and businesses alike. Mr. Speaker, there are people who oppose this government for various reasons. That is their right. This is a democracy. However, it is unreasonable for any critic to say this is not an emergency and these powers are not necessary. That argument, Mr. Speaker, is simply wrong. One cannot say that we do not need certain emergency orders and at the same time say that the virus remains very serious. Saying both of these at the same time is wholly contradictory and makes no sense. The emergency powers orders give the government the necessary ability to act quickly to prevent or lessen viral spread. The provisions in the emergency power orders are being prescribed as narrowly as possible. No activity by citizens and residents is prohibited or constrained unless required for public health and safety purposes. Our health team surveys the circumstance, analyze, analyzes the data, and makes recommendation to combat the virus based on the situation at hand. We take that advice, Mr. Speaker, and use the emergency powers orders to save lives. Without the emergency powers orders, the virus would run wild in our communities, killing a large number of people in record time. This is how serious this crisis is, Mr. Speaker. That is how infectious and deadly this virus is. Mr. Speaker, my government, this government, does not like lockdowns. We understand they are hard on family life. They are hard on businesses and individuals' finances. They are hard on people's mental health. When virus cases increases, we try first to impose other restrictive measures. But if cases rises exponentially and virus spread is out of control, we may have no choice but to order a specific area locked down to save lives, as have most governments. That is, most governments around the world, including countries that have been acknowledged to have had generally a good response to the pandemic. But thankfully, Mr. Speaker, based on the data at hand, 
we appear to be nearing the end of our second wave of this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, allow me to expand on this particular point. When I say we can do selected or aerial lockdowns, I live in the West. So let's take for example, and this is just an example, I'm just picking a scenario, this is not reality. But if an infection, let's say, was in the Gambia area, we can lock that area off and resolve that issue. In Adelaide, we can do the same thing. In Mount Pleasant, we can do the same thing. And there are different segments throughout New Providence, and that's what I meant when I speak about selected, not broad-based. But thankfully, Mr. Speaker, we are, if each and every one of us would cooperate, stop the late social gathering, those are what are our challenges today. We would be able to come out of this viral infectious phenomenon very, very quickly. So let me be very clear, Mr. Speaker. The second wave is not yet over. Additionally, given global trends, we can likely face a third wave but we have, we entered this viral pandemic without ammunition. The world knew not, knew not what to do. We were all fighting an invisible enemy and we had no ammunition. They were aggressively working on vaccine, which is, would be our permanent ammunition, but as the virus and the disease progressed, we then recognized that we have an ammunition, an ammunition of mask wearing, an ammunition of social distancing, and an ammunition of proper sanitization. The ammunition is not expensive. It doesn't that be after trucks with real missiles, guns, etc. But we have our ammunition. Let us use them, Mr. Speaker. Wear a mask. Save lives. Save your country. That is what you can do for your country. Mr. Speaker, so I'm moving forward in our success, but then on us adhering to protocols, adhering to travel protocols as we commence international flights, we travel protocols would not be expensive, but it calls for discipline. And that discipline can prevent us from experiencing another surge as we've just recently experienced and about to come out. Our borders are open today, but as individuals recognize that the Bahamas is truly open for business and the virus decreasing and our family islands are basically almost free or considered free because there are a certain number that we must live with, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> we cannot aim for zero. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Just like the flu is with us, that will be with us. So we must manage it. 
It will be like our brothers and sisters. We can nothing we can do. So we have to live with it. But let's keep the numbers down. That's the most important thing. Down. And if we keep the numbers down, we are okay. And the Bahamas would be recognized as a COVID free destination. It means that our real property values would probably go up. Our home rentals would probably go up. The Airbnbs will go up. The family islands, Andres, will blossom. Even I trying to buy, even I'm trying to buy a property in Andres. I don't want government property. I don't want nobody accuse me. I'm trying to buy a property in Andres. So I want to build a home in Andres. No, 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 no. <laughs> I love the family islands. I, I, I love the family islands. And to be honest with you, I would like to spend all my weekends in the family islands if I could. I love the family islands. And I can say with confidence that I will retire in the family islands. <laughs> And I look forward, I, I look forward to that retirement in 2027. Yes! <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I thank our hard-working medical team for all that they have done to help reduce the numbers over these recent months. I also thank the Bahamian people for their compliance and cooperation with the public health guidelines. And while there are some who ignore the measures, the large majority of Bahamians and residents are abiding by these measures. They have worn their mask. They have tried to stay physically distant. They have kept their hands sanitized and away from their faces. Until there is a vaccine or treatment, these are still the best measures to keep Bahamians and their families safe. And as I've said before, Mr. Speaker, the pandemic is far from over. In fact, it is possible there could be a third wave in the Bahamas, and there has been a as there has been and will be in other countries, but we have the ammunition to prevent it. It's up to us. Don't allow us to experience what we are going through now again. We can prevent it. We know this from the pattern of spread of the virus, Mr. Speaker. It's very contagious as people travel more outside of their homes, congregate and let their guards down. When one wave ends, the virus comes back. So, we must guard against complacency. We must not let our guards down. As a people, we must do all we can to lessen the impact of a third wave. Key to this, Mr. Speaker, is that each of us and all of us must be even more committed to using the measures we used to slow the first and second wave. The more we consistently comply with these recommendations, the better we may control a third wave. By limiting the number of people infected in a third wave, we lessen the need to impose the most restrictive measures such as aerial or regional lockdowns. Fighting COVID-19 is a national effort and we have to work together. The virus is not concerned about red, yellow or green. In order for the virus to survive, Mr. Speaker, 
it must get into our bodies. My body is not different from South and Central Andres' body or even Exuma's body. The virus can live in any of our bodies. And therefore, we are all a part of this fight. Let us fight and conquer this virus. Let us start our economic engine running after which we can start our political fight but save our country at this particular time. Each and every Bahamian and resident speaker is key to our success. It only takes one infected person going to a gathering and not following guidelines to cause hundreds of infections. Let history remember us, South Andres. Let history remember us as one of the most disciplined nation during a pandemic. Let history remember us as the small nation that led the world in eradicating and conquering this pandemic. Let us be remembered, South Andres and Exuma, as a people who worked together toward a common goal of keeping our communities as COVID-free as possible continued national commitment to that common goal and common good will save lives and lessen suffering. Mr. Speaker, let me close by again thanking our medical and health experts for their unwavering dedication, national spirit, and love of country. I also I also again thank Dr. Merceland Dahl Regis, who deserved the highest praise and high national recognition for her tireless efforts on behalf of us all. She is a symbol and example of the best of the Bahamian spirit. She has remained steadfast and dedicated to the greater good and the common good. I am sure, I am sure, as I look at you, the members of opposition, you too, I am sure the House will join me in acknowledging the good work of Dr. Dahl Regis and the health experts. There are, so, there are so many fine examples of this spirit of resilience, determination, and national loyalty which will bring us to a better day. But for now, for now, let us stay resolved and let us stay strong in the fight against this deadly virus. Let us stay strong in our determined efforts to open our country in order to restore lives and livelihoods. Mr. Speaker, I support the extension of the emergency powers orders and ask God's blessings on our Bahamas. And before I move this resolution, Mr. Speaker, I would advise all Bahamians to kind, please, obtain your flu shots. The hospitals are already overstretched and overburdened. Our medical team are overworked. And in spite of that, they continue to work. They continue to deliver health for the safety of our people. But they are tired. If we took our flu shots, 
that would decrease the incidence of flu and thus decrease that extra demand on our hospital, thus compromising our hospital facilities and making, uh, making it even worse and placing us in an even more difficult predicament. So again, I urge and I ask all behemoths, especially those who would be at risk, the elderly and others, to kindly obtain your flu shots. Mr. Speaker, I so move, and thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Is there a second? The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Bamboo Town. <laughs> Detail. Substantive contributions as to why we should maintain this emergency order. Mr. Speaker, I am fond of doing, I rise. Say thanks be to God who always 